It is good to see everybody. I miss being with you last Wednesday night. Uh, been very, very busy at work and things just didn't work out to be able to get away, get here in time, but I appreciate so much uh, Don filling in. I uh, heard he did a great job and appreciate his efforts, but it's good to be back with you. I don't like being away. Uh, I enjoy our classes and glad to be able to be here tonight. David, would you lead us in a word of prayer to start our class? Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy great name. Father, we have gathered together here in all humbleness to study your holy and divine word. Father, we want to thank you for this beautiful day that you blessed us with and all the many blessings that we receive from you each day of our lives. So often we fail to give you the credit for those blessings. Father, tonight we ask that you would help us to clear our hearts and minds of the daily trials and situations that we face. Help us to fully concentrate upon what God brings us tonight. Let us think on it and study upon it and apply it to our daily lives as Christians. Father, we pray that you would be all those that are sick, whether it be physically or spiritually. Put your hand of blessing upon them and heal them in the way that only you can be thy will. Father, go with each of us as we go through our lives. Continue to give us the courage and the strength that we need to always live according to your word, so that we can not only be the best Christians possible, but we can also be a guiding light for all those we come in contact with. Father, we pray that you go with us through the remainder of this service. Keep us all safe and harm. Bring us back. Amen. Well, let's start out tonight with just a little bit of a review of what we talked about two weeks ago. The way that these units are laid out, it's important for us to keep in mind the progression of thought as we've been looking at. And in this chapter, we're talking about the subject of creation versus evolution. And two weeks ago, we introduced this thought and we talked a little bit about the fact that when we think about the subject of evolution, there are some types of evolution, some aspects of evolution that we look at from the standpoint of being children of God and we immediately say, well, that cannot be true because that stands in opposition to what God's Word teaches. But we also talked about the fact that there are other types of evolution and really, these other types of evolution, we don't generally use the term evolution to refer to them because that term has such a strong negative stigma to it in our society today, and especially among Christians today. On the first hand, you have what's referred to as macroevolution, and this is what we would think of as being on a grand scale. And this is generally what people think about when they think of evolution, how everything essentially came from nothing, that life came from non-life, and that the species that we see on Earth today have evolved from other species over time, and that essentially there's nothing there to dictate what a species can evolve into. And that's why those that promote this view, they will look at human beings and they will trace human beings back, at least according to their determination, they'll trace human beings back through, uh, through primates and through reptiles and through fish and birds and what have you, all the way back to just this single cell organism. And they say that over roughly about 14 billion years, man has evolved to where we are today. Of course, we don't believe that. We uh, look at that, we see that that stands in opposition to what God's Word teaches very clearly in Genesis, the first chapter. But as our book also sets forth very clearly, there is another type of evolution. And we don't, as I said, generally refer to this process by the term evolution. We refer to it more so from the standpoint of adaptation. We see changes among species over time. But what you see in this type of evolution, this type of change, you don't see one species changing into another species. You see changes among that species. Now, 
one of the things that we can look at with this. We look at human beings who live at different places on the planet. Those who live in desert climates, generally their skin will take on a darker tone. They will develop a much stronger tolerance for heat. Ultimately, their bodies will change over time to fit the environment that they're in. We look at those that live in cold climates. We see with them it's been proven that their skin will actually thicken over time. Um, Their eyelashes, some of them will actually grow thicker eyelashes to help block out some of the reflection of the sun off of the snow. Does that mean that they are evolving into a different species? No, they are still human beings. But what it means is that they are adapting to their environment. Well, scientists look at this and they say, well, this is a form of evolution. Well, when we look at that, that's not something that we can discount because that's something that we can observe. That's something that we see that there's fact to back it up. Another example you may remember from uh, biology, uh, biology classes, science classes that you may have taken in school, back during the Industrial Revolution in Europe, where many of these large factories were coal-powered, and they would spew just this black ash out of the smokestacks. Well, in many of the forests that would surround those factories, there was a species of moth. And that moth was called the peppered moth. Well, in its original natural form, they are white in color. Well, over time, as this soot began to coat all of the trees and all of the plants, obviously those white moths really didn't have any protection from the predators that were around them. And so over time, guess what happened? they began to change color. And so now you will find peppered moths that are solid white. You will find ones that are solid black. And you will find ones that have different, uh, different levels of speckling of white with uh, patches of black. And it's because they adapted over time to where they were uh, more suited to adapt in their environment. Well, this is just another form of what's called microevolution or small-scale evolution. And so whenever we look at this subject of evolution from the standpoint of the study that we're taking now, we're not talking about small scale. Because as we mentioned, small scale, it's provable. We see changes within a species over time. A couple of weeks ago, we talked about Uh, all of the different varieties of animals there are. You look at all of the different varieties of dog, all the different varieties of of cattle, all, all of the different animals that we see in the world, all the different varieties. Does that mean that they are a different species? No. They have just adapted in different ways over time. They have changed over time for a variety of reasons. Then we talked a little bit about the fact how there is a growing... Uh, growing trend, especially in the United States, of people who desire for there to be more than just one theory as to the origin of the world taught in the public school system. You know, for many, many years, it has been the standing, well, we're going to teach the theory of evolution and we're not going to teach creationism. Well, now there is a growing number of people, in fact, a majority of people polled in the United States today see no problem with having the theory of evolution and what they refer to as the theory of creationism both taught and leaving it up to the individuals being taught to determine which one they believe to be the most credible. Now, in a sense, I look at that and I say that's a good thing because we see more and more interest in creationism. And the reason that is, is because as time passes by, there are more and more cracks being formed in the theory of evolution. 
there are more and more pieces of evidence being found that destroy that view. And so they're grasping at things, trying to, uh, trying to come up with some type of a solution. And so now they're saying, well, let's just throw all these different ideas out there and let the students decide for themselves what they believe to be the truth. Well, in a sense, this is a good thing. But in another sense, I look at that, and that really leaves the door wide open for a wide variety of other teachings to come along. Because if you're going to say that any view of origins can be taught, then what would keep someone else from coming along and developing some other idea, some other theory, something even more far-fetched and outlandish than the theory of evolution? Do we really want to sit back and say, you know what, yeah, you, you teach our kids every theory that there is out there. And so on that hand, I look at that and I say, well, you know, that's not really a good idea. That's not really a good stance for us to take. But it is promising that we see more and more interest, especially in our country, being shown toward these options other than just blanketly accepting the theory of evolution. So some things to consider, and this is where we're going to pick up our study for tonight. We see some credibility, we see some arguments being made here that point to the truthfulness, that point to the validity of what's referred to as the creation model, or as scientists would call it, the theory of creation. And the first is known as the law of biogenesis. Now... Who can tell me what the word Genesis means? Beginnings. So when we think of the law of biogenesis, bio is a term meaning life. So the beginning of life. So here we see the law of biogenesis. And what this states is that life can only be produced by life. And here's what I mean by that. What does it take for a child to be born? Well, it takes two individuals with life for that to take place. What does it take for a plant to grow? Well, it has to come from other plant life producing that seed. Now, if we go all the way back to the beginning and we stop and we think, and I want you to wrap your mind around this concept for just a moment. What is the only thing that we can think of that we've ever heard about that has ever been produced that did not come from another source of life. Man. Man came from the dust of the ground. How did man obtain life? God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. But you think about this also. What about the other acts of creation? Where did the original plants come from? They didn't come from life. God spoke those things into existence. Where did the animals come from? They didn't come from life. So when you look at this concept of the law of biogenesis, well, we understand that in the way, in the the course or the, the flow of this universe... The only way for something with life to come into existence is it has to come from a life source. Now, in order for creation to be true, I'm sorry, in order for evolution to be true, they claim that everything came from just a spontaneous generation meaning there was nothing alive and suddenly there was an explosion that brought about life. But for creation to be true, we have to look at this and we have to say, no, really, the earth, the plants, the animals, man, we came from a life source, didn't we? We sing a song, our God, he is what? Alive. Alive. 
So when we trace this back and we look at it, those original creations, they weren't created in the sense that we see uh, reproduction taking place, but they still were created by a life source. And that life source was not that all of the matter and all of the energy in the atmosphere suddenly reached that critical mass and a great explosion took place and suddenly, hey, there's life. It doesn't work that way. How do they, how do they reconcile where this matter came from that exploded? And, that, and that's a question that no one is able to answer. Because one of the arguments that we'll see as we get further into our study, I think it's in the next section, it talks about this idea that science has proven that there has to be an equal amount of energy and matter. And they say that that equal amount, one day, as I said, it reached this this critical point, this, this perfect storm, and suddenly there was an explosion that set this evolutionary process in motion. One thing that I think that a lot of people have a misconception of whenever it comes to the theory of evolution, those who believe in evolution, they are not taking the stance that when this Big Bang or this explosion took place, that suddenly this world came into existence exactly in the way that it is today. What they say is that when this explosion took place, that it created Earth and atmosphere in its uh, infant form. Well, you know, we could kind of look at this, and one of the arguments they make, they say, well, what does Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2 say? In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's verse 1. Verse 2. And the earth was what? Was without form, void, Darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God moved upon the face of what? The waters. Now, those who try to pair up evolution and creation, or at least evolution and and, and a godly source, they'll look at Genesis chapter 2 and they'll say, well, there, you're seeing earth in its elementary state. They say, verse 1, when God created the heavens and the earth, how do we know God didn't cause the Big Bang? How do we know that God wasn't the one that that caused this equal amount of energy and matter to come together and cause this great explosion? And then you come into verse 2, well, that shows earth in its elementary state. And then as you go along, we have this idea known as the gap theory that between each of those days of creation, you had millions and sometimes billions of years that took place. Well, there's so many arguments that we can look at, and we'll get to that point as we go along. But coming back to this argument here, this idea that life cannot arise from a non-living source completely removes this whole idea of the theory of evolution because those who promote this theory, they say that all life on earth can be traced back to what? To a single cell organism. Where did that cell come from? Where did the life in that organism come from? It had to have come from a life source. Because this law of biogenesis is a proven fact. It's not a theory. It's not an idea. It's a proven fact that only life can come from life. But we know where that life source is, don't we? It's God. God, our living God, is the giver of life. But in order for evolution to be true that they have to be able to prove that life can be generated spontaneously. And there's never been a single time in any type of testing, in any type of observation whatsoever, where scientists have been able to prove that life can come from non-life. It just doesn't happen. You can't take something that's dead and bring forth life from it. 
It doesn't work that way. Now, in recent years, there have been scientists that have tried to disprove this. They've tried to look at it. They've looked. They rather than referring to it as a law, which it is. We understand the difference in a theory and a law. A theory is an idea that's not been proven. A law is a proven theory, meaning this has been proven to be true. But now they say, well, no, this law of biogenesis, you know, it's just a good idea. It's just a a principle, a theory. And they say, we call it a theory because we've not found a way to produce life from non-life. They say, we believe that that can happen. You know what we call that? We call that faith, don't we? They have faith that they can do that, but they don't have faith that God could have created these things. And so they say, even though this has been proven for centuries to be the case, we're going to say it's a theory because we don't like it, because we have our own ideas. This is what we think is the truth. But we've not found a way to prove that yet. Well, the fact is, they can't prove it. They can't prove it because there's no evidence to back it up. You cannot produce life from non-life. All right, let's look at this next section, natural selection. Natural selection is what Charles Darwin was really well known for. And Charles Darwin's idea... People began to argue against his theory, and, and we make some of these same arguments today. You know, if well, if we evolved from monkeys, why are there still monkeys? Well, people began to make those kind of arguments toward Darwin when he first began to promote his theory of evolution. And so he developed, and actually, uh, the book that he wrote, we commonly refer to it as The Origin of Species, but if you go further on, it actually says, based upon natural selection. Well, natural selection says that only the superior forms of the species are going to survive. And so people will look at that and they'll say, well, that's why there's no more cavemen. That's why there's no more Neanderthals. That's why... Uh, you only see human beings in this form that we call homo sapiens today. That's why you don't see any of these other types of that kind of species. They say because over time homo sapiens became the superior species and basically it's this idea of survival of the fittest. Whoever's the strongest, whoever is the Uh, most suited for their environment, whoever has the ability to withstand the pressures of life the most, they're going to be the one that's going to survive. And so this is where he looked at that and he said, well, humans must have evolved from a superior form of primate, but they evolved before these lesser forms of primates were completely eradicated. Because his view is that whatever the superior form of the species is, is going, to, is going to destroy the lesser forms of the species. And some of the examples that we see, our book talks about, that for instance you have a horse that has long legs. The longer the legs of the horse, the faster it's going to be able to run. It's going to be able to get away predators faster than those that are smaller that can't run faster. And it's this idea of the one that is the most fit. You know, going back to what we were looking at at the very beginning of this lesson, could we not look at this concept of microevolution or adaptation and make the argument that what is fit in one environment is not fit in another environment? Think about that. You take someone that lives in a very cold climate and you put them in the desert, are they going to function very well? No. No. You take someone and and reverse that. You take someone that has lived in the desert, put them in a cold climate. It's not going to work. They're not going to function as well as those who have adapted to their surroundings. 
And so this is why whenever you look at different climates and different areas of the earth, you will find different forms of the same species, but they may look different. They may, some may be taller, some may be bigger, some may be smaller. They may uh, have different color patterns, things of that nature, because they have adapted better to their surroundings. Well, the theory of evolution says, well, no, that can't be the case because in a species, you can only have a superior form of that species. Well, of course, this ideology has bred a lot of problems in the past. You look at all of the people in the past that have tried to argue for a superior race of people. You look at those who try to argue that you know, those who don't look like me, you know, I, I'm, I must be higher evolved than they are. So I must be the superior one. Well, how do I know that they're not the superior one? You know, I mean, that, that's just kind of the ideology that people look at. You know, this theory of the survival of the fittest, you know, it's all of those that look a certain way. They are going to be the ones that are seen as fit. Well, this is why... We've seen so many issues in so many places on earth with people who have oppressed those who look different than they do. Well, there's been hundreds of millions of people killed during World War II because uh, Hitler had the idea of a superior race. That's right. With exact uh, measurements, colorations, hair, eyes, the whole thing. That's right. That's right. And, and the thing that I always found unique was the ones that he thought was superior looked nothing like him. And so, I mean, that, that's kind of one of those things we look at and we just kind of shake our heads whenever we look at, at where this rationale comes from. But we've seen this so many times. You see this as well among those who are, are breeders of certain types of animals. You know, they want to get this specific look in whatever that dog or whatever that livestock, whatever it is that they're raising, they have a specific look that they want. And so they'll call out the animals that don't fit their standards. And they'll keep only that which fits what they think is the fittest image. I read after some historians that say, we were talking about the difference between what way Hitler looked and what he presumed to be the master race. Uh, supposedly, the master race was based on the Nordic people. Uh, they were bigger, they were all, most of them all were blonde, all these characteristics, and that's what they were trying to make a superior race bigger, faster, healthier, with a certain look about it, even though he didn't meet that criteria. That's right. And there's hundreds of people killed. And, and a certain degree over that idea. That's I mean, right. All about that, but. Well, and one of the things that our book presents, and, and this is something that I really had to give a lot of thought to, because when I first read this, it really didn't sit well with me when I first read this. There's a, there's a statement here that talks about, it says creationists, and this is at the top of page five. It says creationists, never have objected to the idea of natural selection as a mechanism for eliminating unfit, non-adapted organisms. As a matter of fact, creationists long before Darwin said that natural selection was a conservation principle as a screening device for getting rid of the unfit. Natural selection represents the creator's plan for preventing harmful mutations from affecting and destroying the entire species. And that is all it does. Now you think about that for just a moment. Whenever we consider what this is saying, where do we find the determination of what's unfit? Where do we find the determination of what it's saying here, uh, getting rid of the unfit and the harmful? Where do, we, where do we get that? So in looking at this, and it's something that I'm still trying to wrap my minds around or my mind around, and if you notice it says that this is one of the arguments 
that creationists try to use to explain um, why we see natural selection in some forms in life. But when you stop and you think, do we still see people who are being affected by, say, harmful gene mutations? Yes. Do we still see children who are born with birth defects because of genetic issues? So if this is a work of God to prevent those things, why are those things still taking place? And so that's why I look at this and I, and I kind of see some red flags coming up there with this point of view. Because if they're going to make the argument, and notice the, the writers of this aren't saying this is fact. They're saying this is one of the ideas that people have promoted uh, to try to explain from a creationist point of view. Well, we know that this world, the way that it functions, the way that it reproduces, the way that it's sustained, it's here because this is the way that God set it into motion. God created it in such a way to where if these principles are things that we see taking place, and I think that to an extent we do see this concept of the survival of the fittest among some species. You know, we've all heard people, uh, when we talk about this, this concept of the devil as a roaring lion walking about seeking whom he may devour, and, and, and I know I have and some of you probably have as well, you've used the illustration of, of these uh, shows that you see on television to where you may see a pack of gazelle or whatever out there and there may be one that's weak, that's not getting around as well as the others. It may have some type of mutation, some type of deformity there. Well, which one is the easiest prey for the lion? The one that is not fit. And so in looking at this, personally, I don't think this is a good argument for us to look at and say, well, this is how God purifies the species. I don't think that's the point that we need to look at from this. I don't think God is is using this concept of the survival of the fittest to determine who's going to live, who's going to die, who's going to be able to uh, to mature, and who's going to um, ultimately never uh, never reach full uh, full maturity. Yes, ma'am. Right. 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 And and I think that we can make that argument as well, like I was talking about with the pepper moths. You know, before they began to evolve and change colors. You know, I mean they um, they were unfit for their surroundings. I mean they they would have been wiped out if they had not begun that transformation within their species. Um, but certainly in, in the wild, like you said, I mean, there are certain species it's been proven that because of certain, uh, certain weaknesses or certain mutations, things of that nature, they're not as suitable to live in the wild. And I, I think we could probably also look at that from some of the pets that we have as well. You know, I don't think a chihuahua dog is really bred to survive very well out in the wild, you know, I mean, they're, uh, they're going to be bred more so for uh, being kept in the house, being pampered, things like that. The more purebred they are, the weaker they are. And, and a lot of times that's the case, yes, yes. But in regard to this, looking at this idea of natural selection, does it exist to an extent? Yes. We see this concept of survival of the fittest, those who are weak generally they're not going to live as long. Generally, if it's an animal or if it's a plant, they're going to be killed. They're going to be uh, become prey for another animal much quicker than those who are stronger. And so to an extent, we see that, but I don't think that this is an argument that we can look at and say, well, this is what God is using to maintain the purity of a species. And there's been a lot of 
There's been a lot of issues that have taken place in history from people taking that type of mentality. Uh, There's some of you here that are old enough to remember when many people would make the argument that African Americans were less evolved than um, white Anglo-Saxon Caucasian European uh, background. And they were mistreated greatly. And it's not just that one example. We see that many other places and at many other times in history. But it's because people have looked at these kinds of theories, these kinds of arguments, and then they even want to try to bring God into the mix. And you can't do that. Yes, During sir? World War II, the Air Corps proved, disproved that theory of the black people weren't capable of doing so because for when the war broke out, all they used black for was manual labor. But the Tuscany situation, they made pilots because they wound up to be some of the best pilots they ever had, the Air Corps ever had during World War II, out of black folks. Yeah. They proved that the theory of, uh, of their inability wasn't there. That's right. You educate them and, and give them the same chance. And in a lot of cases, they're superior. And that's and that's where we come back to this idea of their environment. Yeah. You know, be it be it human beings, be it animals, be it plants, whatever the case may be, they adapt. They soak up whatever their experiences are, whatever their environment is. And so that's where we look at this natural selection, and we see the weaknesses in this point of view. Any any. I got it. Yeah. And when my husband became a, a survivor of the 92 below zero military group, they had to survive out in the elements for three weeks. He, he had to learn the, the knowledge of the Eskimos first before he could go. Right. So, I mean, it, well, and kind of along that same line, um, one thing that I always found very interesting, especially when, when Christy and I were in Alaska, most of the people that made up the churches in Alaska were not native Alaskans. They were people that had gone to Alaska to work in the military, work pipeline work, things of that nature. But they found that over time, as they had children, their children began to look more and more like native Alaskans. And it was because of these things that we were talking about, you know, the, the thickening of the skin and things of that nature. They were adapting to those uh, surroundings. And so it's kind of interesting whenever you you look at those things. But we're going to stop there. Uh, Lord willing, next Wednesday night we'll pick up with this uh, subject of genetics. Hopefully we will finish this chapter, go through the review, and be ready to pick up with Lesson 6 in two weeks.